by the composition of the audience. Most people weren't at Worcester last September. It's sort of a summation of the, the published evidence, and there hasn't been that much in the past few months. The last half, we're going to talk about a randomized uh, trial, which um, I, I messaged uh, the groups at Lionsgate and St. Paul's because really it, it is their trial, and I thought people might be interested in seeing the results. It's not very often that multi-center randomized trials get done in Western Canadian emergency departments, and the results are actually quite interesting. And this really took uh, everybody cooperating very nicely to, uh, to to make this happen. The results are unpublished for this, so this is the first time anyone will have seen them. Uh, you know, usually I only present after it's already accepted somewhere, but uh, the paper hasn't been even submitted yet, but it will be very soon. So we're going to talk about atrial arrhythmias in the emergency department, and um, this refers to atrial fibrillation and flutter, which are very common arrhythmias. That are probably it's, it's, outside of PVCs are the most common ones that we see. For the first half of the discussion, we're going to treat fibrillation and flutters the same way, since the ACC AHA guidelines tell us that they're to be managed in the same way. I won't even ask the residents too many questions today. So there we go. So, so this patient has atrial fibrillation. Okay, uh, this is a very typical story, and um, and this is often what we hear. And these are patients often that end up being discharged from the emergency department very quickly. This is also a typical story of AFib, right? Somebody with some Framingham risk factors, with some uncertain symptoms for an uncertain length of time. And some of these patients end up getting admitted and some of them end up getting discharged. And this is also an AFib patient here. This is a patient who's got a lot of problems with an uncertain diagnosis. And these patients almost certainly end up getting admitted. Uh, the trouble is there's only one set of atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter guidelines, and they're supposed to cover all these patients, which makes our job as emergency physicians much, much more difficult. <laughs> so right now we rely largely on cardiology evidence. We look at the ACC AHA guidelines and the ESC guidelines, which are largely written you know, by cardiologists. There's not a lot of emergency physicians working there. As a matter of fact, the only one even on the CCS guidelines is, is Dr. Steele. Uh, in, in for the ACC AHA guidelines and the ESC guidelines, emergency rep physicians are, are non-represented there. And, and yet we do see a lot of these patients that cardiologists will never see. Now, cardiology evidence is basically, um, so residents, what's, what's class one evidence? Uh, pardon? So you got it switched around, but you're clo you, you got the you got it switched around a tiny bit. That's the, the level part. The class part is the, the magnitude of the effect. So it is uh, you know class one evidence a much much stronger than B. Now here's where you're totally correct is the level, and that's multiple randomized trials, whereas level B and C are, are certainly less strength or less evidence for that 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 body of work. I dislike referencing my own work, but the paper on uh, atrial fibrillation in patients with a serious underlying medical illness probably is a strong enough magnitude to be considered level one evidence, but it's class C because it's a single case series, right? That makes it level C evidence. So that's how you categorize this evidence. Anyway, and cardiology, of course, has multiple ran large randomized trials. When you look at the guidelines, a lot of the updates reflect the anticoagulation part of things, which for us is, I guess, important, but it's not the most important thing. But a lot of the guy and I guess there's certain reasons why the anticoagulation would be so heavily uh, represented in the last few focused updates, but it doesn't help us that much, to be honest with you. Now, for cardiology, it also deals with chronic stable atrial fibrillation and flutter patients that can be managed as outpatients. This isn't all done on hospitalized patients, generally done on stable admitted inpatients. Now, what, what do we have from the emergency department evidence? Well, we generally extrapolate from cardiology evidence, which, as we've sort of seen in some of the previous studies, is maybe not the greatest idea always. And this is a, such a fundamental thing that it can never get enough across to both our residents and, and internal medicine and cardiology residents who seem to think that, you know, every, like, you know, septic patient with a rapid AFib needs immediate electroconversion, which we've seen very recently in the department, actually. We had a pretty serious case where um, uh, a patient was uh, quite sick, as a patient of chronic kidney disease, was very ill, had an acute coronary syndrome, was in rapid AFib, and numerous cardiologists and internists decided to... Um, sedate and convert the patient with predictable results. So cardiology patients, the evidence derived in cardiology patients does not necessarily apply to our patients. So, you know, they see chronic stable AFib, we see whatever, and it just happens to have AFib as well. And disentangling the atrial fibrillation from whatever else might be going on is really your most important goal. Once you've pulled aside the component or the contribution of the AFib and flutter, then you can decide to proceed, and then sometimes you can use the guidelines.
So there's a number of categorizations for this. Um, firstly, we have the incredibly rare case of a patient being unstable because of atrial fibrillation. We'll get exactly into how rare this is. Then we have patients that are unstable with atrial fibrillation, and that's actually quite common. Then we have the anticoagulation aspects, which you know uh, we're actually doing some research on, which I'll probably report. Uh, then we have rate versus rhythm control, which uh, you know sort of um, guidelines will tell us either one is acceptable. And lastly, we'll deal with uh, with disposition of patients. So firstly, we'll start with patients that are unstable due to atrial fibrillation, and this is incredibly rare. The vast majority of the time, when you have a patient with a low blood pressure, poor urine output, malperfusion, confusion, and atrial fibrillation, there's something else going on. It's not just atrial fibrillation. So when patients show up like this with AFib, it's usually something else, and look out for that something else. So how often have I seen a patient with, who's unstable due to atrial fibrillation? Well, it's one patient in 11 years of doing this. I've seen one patient. Um, he showed up numerous times here before he died. Uh, late 50s, uh, diabetic, hypertensive, palliative coronary artery disease, single-digit ejection fraction, prior stroke. He'd show up the uh, last Wednesday or Thursday of every month, having sampled largely of uh, strong beer and crack cocaine, be converted, and then usually consult the cardiology when he eloped. He'd show up every month or two with the same thing. Ultimately, he died. That's the only patient I've ever seen. Please don't extrapolate it that everybody who's in the situation has these risk factors. But that's the only patient I've ever seen in 11 years of doing this. So this is incredibly, incredibly rare. Now, even though it says immediate conversion, that doesn't really help you practically very much, does it? So what would we use? Well, we'd probably use ketamine. Right, as, as a sedating agent. I mean, I guess if you only had automatate, you might use that as well. But uh, generally speaking, you wouldn't want to use fentanyl, midazolam, or propofol because the pressures are very, very soft. Uh, and you should probably prepare for resuscitation. Uh, that means uh, having inotropes on board, having airway management on board, having uh, your RT on board, having nurses on board, having a ventilator on board. You, you should be prepared for this pact as patient is going to arrest most likely. And uh, that's about all the advice I can give you. This is... Uh, you know, very poor evidence. No one's ever really studied the unstable patient due to AFib just because they are incredibly, incredibly rare. So these are, I'm going to get those guys out of the way immediately. It doesn't happen very often. So next we'll deal with the patient that's unstable because of their atrial fibrillation. And these are patients who are generally older and they have lots of other problems. They have acute heart failure. They have sepsis. They have a PE. They have acute kidney injury. They have a GI bleed. They have COPD. They have thyrotoxicosis. They have, you know, disseminated malignancy. These patients are quite sick. The trouble is with these patients is they're sick, and sometimes the treatments for AFib directly conflict with the treatments for their underlying disease. And identifying these patients is probably the single most important thing you can do from an AFib point of view. Again, this won't be in any sort of guidelines because it's not glamorous, it's not spectacular, and uh, cardiologists would never even see these patients. So it's about one-third of our patients at St. Paul's and Mount St. Joseph's and presumably VGH, Royal Columbian, possibly Lionsgate, will show up like this, whether in AFib, whether it's slow or it's usually it's fast. Uh, they may be normotensive, which may actually be hypot relatively hypotensive for them, and uh, they have something else going on. And the key is the identification part of things. Once you've identified them as having something else going on, then you can step backward and proceed. So what are the risk features for having an underlying acute illness? Well... First of all, older patients. The median age of these patients is, is over 80, probably 82 or 83, which means very few patients under the age of 75 will be having this. The exception are people with, you know, congenitally bad hearts, uh, patients who, uh, you know, patients with endocarditis, patients with multiple risk factors, transplants, that kind of stuff, uh, immunosuppressed patients. Those patients may get at a substantially younger age. But generally speaking, you got to be fairly old and fairly have a number of risk factors to get this. The CHADS-2 score is invariably of one. It's usually three or four. These are quite sick patients, usually chronically ill. And they all usually show up with atypical presentations. So the first slide here showed that the, you know, sort of one of the presentations of AFib was a 55-year-old male with a couple hours of palpitations after hockey practice and a few beers. That is not this patient. This is your 86-year-old who's dizzier than normal, looks worse than normal, is weaker than normal. They will not complain of palpitations. They'll be more short of breath. They'll feel generally more awful than normal. They might have some chest pain, but they're not going to show up with palpitations for five hours. They'll have two or three days of a slow decline, generally speaking, or perhaps even more. So that's what I mean by atypical presentation. So if you have AFib and somebody runs up to you and says, you know, I've got a, you know, an EKG with AFib on it, you got to do something, and you see they're 88 years old, and they've had numerous admissions for heart failure before, and they got a temperature of 38, and they're a bit confused, 
I wouldn't be reaching for the paddles just about then. And the important thing is also, when you're referring these patients to internists or cardiologists, resist the temptation to do what they say, because they're going by their own guidelines, which don't cover these patients. So it does happen sometimes that, you know, people will say, well, how are you going to slow them down? What are you going to do? Well, you know, that we'll come to that. But it's sometimes not to apply those guidelines. So avoid, I know this is tough, but avoid managing the AFib first. What you might want to do here is just step back a little bit. If you treat the AFib first as AFib, the adverse events rates increase about tenfold, and the serious adverse events increase way higher than that. And by serious adverse events, I mean intubation, inotrope, CPR, death. Those things increase way more if you start applying aggressive therapies. So you get to identify and treat the underlying condition, which is not always straightforward. In the meantime, consider temporizing with fluids. Sometimes when I hear, oh, what are you doing to slow them down? You should beta block this septic patient. I say, well, I'm just going to give them some fluids. So sometimes these patients have to be treated as, instead of tachycardia with AFib, sinus tachycardia. You have to actually, you know, pull yourself out of that framing bias and say, this is AFib and I better treat it as AFib to saying, look, he's not sick because of his AFib. He's getting AFib because he's sick. I'll treat him like a sinus tachycardia and see what happens. It doesn't really matter that much if they convert or not. Your job is to maintain hemodynamic profile. Once you start applying, you know, procainamide, beta blockers, uh, you know, calcium channel blockers, sedation, their pressure tends to dump. Now, these patients need thorough investigation. So right now, I know at St. Paul and Mount St. Joseph's, our nurses usually put in a CBC, a troponin, you know, a rapid metabolic panel on a chest X-ray. Well, these guys might need blood cultures. They might need a P. They might need D-dimer. They might need a TSH. They need lots of investigations, really. And during the time when you're doing your investigations, you can slow them down with the way we can attempt to treat them with fluids. But it's better to wait. It's better to, you know, wait half an hour for some tests to come back than it is to just rely simply on an EKG. If you have to get three tests residents, three tests here, EKG, chest X-ray, blood gas. That should explain a lot of stuff. If there's a big VQ mismatch or a big AA gradient or a big lactic acidosis uh, or, a, you know, at that point, that should tell you something else is going on besides atrial fibrillation. And those tests all come back within 10 or 15 minutes, much more quickly than standardized tests do. If you're in a smaller area, don't hesitate to pull off a point of care uh, a qualitative troponin that's either positive or negative. Sometimes these tests uh, are, are absolutely invaluable. But chest X-ray, EKG, and a blood gas will help you a great deal here. So the one thing I could probably recommend when it comes to uh, slowing them down is probably digoxin. And the only reason I can recommend that is it doesn't seem to be quite as bad as some of the medications. In four to six hours, these patients are going to be in your care before they're ultimately transferred up to the ward. Uh, you know, digoxin probably won't slow them down very much. But at the same point, it won't cause any adverse events. Probably the digoxin will take at least 12 to 24 hours to kick in properly. So this is a drug I probably could recommend, even though you, as an emergency physician, probably will not see the effects of this. But digoxin is probably the one medication that could be recommended, half a, uh, half a milligram for starters, and then you can just uh, apply it as slowly as possible and do it in consultation with your, with your internist or perhaps cardiologist who's admitting the patient. This is the one medication that it can't be rejected out of hand. I can't endorse it super strongly, but I can't reject it out of hand either. So. And these patients, and we've seen some bad events when somebody's got a mild pneumonia and AFib, and we're trying to be the hero and send them home. These patients should really be referred. There's a very, very, very small number of these people that can be discharged home. Don't try and be a hero. These people are sick because of their AFib. They have multiple things going on. It's a pretty easy referral to an inter any internist or hospitalist. This is a pretty easy referral. Uh, we've, the number, we've had a couple of bad events happen that I know of in the past 10 years. Again, very few. And often it's been these patients with like a mild pneumonia or a little bit of heart failure, you know, where the physician thought, oh, let's give them some fluids. Hey, they look better. They're not gasping completely. They can at least walk up to the, uh, the bathroom and they look like they want to go home. And then six hours later, they're back in extremis. So be really careful about these guys. Even if you don't want to admit them, at least keep them for, you know, 12 to 24 hours just to see how they do. These, these patients have a, a tendency to get very, very sick. Let's move to anticoagulation here. So, um, first of all, I'm going to interrupt in myself and ask if there's any questions, because that really is probably from a patient safety, from an ED patient safety point of view, it's one of the most important things you can do is identify and treat underlying medical illnesses. Did it, was that explained okay? Are there any questions? Okay, that's very nice. Let's deal with anticoagulation, which is something we also tend not to be very good at. So, but who is good at it? And these are patients that are managed by family physicians, internists, and cardiologists 
tend to have incorrect anticoagulation in the community. Now, these studies were largely done before the uh, novel oral anticoagulants hit in about 2012, 2013. This is about, so things may be a little bit higher. One hates to be cynical, so I'm going to channel my inner Corinne here and say that there's a, been a huge amount of resources dumped into physician education in the last few years. I'm not quite sure why, but uh, I think that maybe community anticoagulation rates have improved a bit, uh, and especially with these new medications coming out. Uh, so uh, I think this is going to be a bit less of a problem, but it's still something you have to watch out for. One of the things that uh, David Ezra will always show you when he runs you through a little medical legal test, and I, I did fail it, was for somebody with like leg pain or whatever, give you a whole bunch of distractions, and there'd be a subtle note to patients in AFib, and then you know you'll be questioning your management, and uh, you know almost almost everybody, including myself, misses the point they're in AFib, and uh, things that if they stroke out or something like that, you as the last physician to see them have some responsibility. So it's something that does need to be looked at, even if somebody shows up with completely incidental atrial fibrillation. So emergency physicians probably miss at least 50% of the chances, and there's a lot of reasons for this. There's time constraints, there's privacy concerns, patients have a lot of questions. When I did the AFib uh, study, I was able to spend a lot of time with patients, like an hour or two, which is a tremendous luxury. It was actually very enjoyable to spend a lot of time with patients, find out what they really felt, because we never really get that opportunity. And a lot of times people would just say, I don't even want to be on this. You know, my, my friend so-and-so uh, told me there's no antidote for this stuff. And, uh, or they'll say, well, so-and-so fell down, or and then they had a huge bleeding afterwards. I never want this stuff. So patients have a lot of reasons for not wanting to be on this. Um, so, and, and those seem to be kind of the reasons. What you have to look at here, the Canadian Cardiovascular Guidelines of become remarkably aggressive in, uh, in, in lifelong anticoagulation. If you're a 65-year-old woman with two seconds of atrial fibrillation, you were supposed to be on lifelong anticoagulation according to the guidelines. And I think there's some of us that feel that is fairly courageous, that's uh, even beyond what the Americans and the Europeans would recommend. But familiarize yourself with CHAD scores, CHAD's VAS scores, and the has bled score. That's the risk factor score for uh, bleeding by anticoagulation. And these are available on medcalc.com. You can easily pull them up on an algorithm. If, you're, if I'm around the eMERGE on the rare occasions that I'm working, uh, you can actually bug me and ask me about this kind of stuff. And uh, that's kind of the algorithm you use for, uh, for, for deciding whether to put somebody on this thing, on anticoagulants. There is a bit of an involved discussion with this as well. There's numerous options, and I'm not going to get into them right now. They've been the subject of the last two or three focused updates from both the Canadian Cardiovascular Society as well as the Americans. I'm not going to get into that right now. Um, consider a short-term prescription. You don't have to put them on lifelong anticoagulation, but just long enough to see their family doctor, internist, cardiologist, AFib clinic. A couple of weeks should really be sufficient for this kind of thing. And documentation thoroughly, especially if a patient uh, if a patient accepts, you have to say you talked about the risk of bleeding. And if a patient declines, you have to say you talked about the risk of stroke and the patient's aware. It's just a line or two in the chart, but yeah, it's an extra onus on yourself. If a patient wants to defer a discussion to a family physician or internist, which many, many of them do, that is a perfectly fair thing to record. As long as it was brought up with them from a medical legal point of view, you are most likely completely covered. I don't know of any law. I talked to Ross about this a while ago. I don't have any lawsuits that have been initiated for against emergency physicians for failure to anticoagulate. But there's a lot more education in the last couple of years about these things, not just to um, not just to physicians, but if you travel in the United States where direct to consumer advertising is permitted, there are tons and tons of ads for 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 novel oral anticoagulants, and patients will be quite aggressive about pushing these things. So again, in Canada, I don't know of any legal action, but it's probably a good thing to write down. So. One thing we've managed to do since a couple of years ago, uh, we were able to show that our physicians were could have used a little bit of improvement with this, is to institute an atrial fibrillation pathway. Unfortunately, Chris DeWitt, who instituted it, isn't here today. But uh, Dr. David Barbick, who's one of our, for those of you who don't know him, is one of our uh, young uh, and extremely enthusiastic researchers, uh, took a, and this is not an easy thing to study, took a look at uh, about 400 patients, half of them before we instituted the pathway and half of them after we instituted the pathway. Here's the before level. So appropriate anticoagulation was maybe two in five. After we instituted the pathway, um, I think that improved a little bit. So, uh, you know, all it took was a little bit of focused education. I agree this is for two centers only to substantially improve the, uh, the risk of uh, or, or the chance that you get anticoagulated properly.
And I don't have to mention that all the other rates of bleeding and stroke and everything stayed exactly the same, which is where they're supposed to. Follow up to a cardiologist once this pathway was instituted also approximately doubled from about 15 to 30 percent. And you know, it's probably more desirable of a cardiologist to follow you up than your walk in clinic physician. So now we'll come to uh, something that uh, is, takes up a little bit of research is rate versus rhythm control. And approximately one third of a emergency department patients are going to be eligible for, uh, for rate or rhythm control. You have one third that are medically unstable, one third that show up with and chronic AFib. And those patients, you're not going to think about using rate or rhythm control about too much. But the ones you can use rate or rhythm control is approximately one third. And generally speaking, if it's great, as we all know, and this is the first thing you learn about AFib in med school, pretty much, if it's greater than 48 hours, you have to use rate control. If it's less than 48 hours, you can use rate or rhythm control. In, in the United States, rate control is certainly used more than rhythm control for the latter group of patients. The caveat here, of course, is that if you've had it for three days or longer and you're appropriately anticoagulated, you can still be managed with rhythm control. Now, the thing is that the symptoms are so unpleasant for healthy young people. If you're under 75 and you've got palpitations, very, very few people are going to wait around for three or four days waiting for it to get better. Most of them know this is really uncomfortable. I have to get to the hospital. And I think I had one patient out of almost 100 in our study that waited longer than, 70, than, than 48 hours. They were actually stuck in Mexico and didn't want to get treated in a the hospital there. They flew back instead, and they were about 50 hours when they came in. So it's such an unpleasant sensation. You almost never meet a healthy young patient who tolerates this for three or four days. So patients do tend to come in. The timing is also a bit of an issue. Often people will say, well, you know, I've felt funny for a week and I felt some fluttering last week, then it went away, you know, and then it came back and went away. But at 3 a.m. this time is when the last episode started, and I can be clear about that. That is reasonable grounds to use to, to say that's your 48 hour cutoff if the, from the last episode that they describe. Of course, if there's language barriers, they're confused, they're showing up with atypical symptoms, there's drug or alcohol on board. At that point, you probably shouldn't take them. That should be taken with a grain of salt. But if somebody gives you a clear history of this stuttering sort of AFib or palpitations for a while, I think it's probably reasonable to assume that the last episode is, is going to be reliable. And if it's under 48 hours, feel free to be aggressive. Now let's talk about rate control here briefly. I think all of us are very, very comfortable with rate control. I hardly see any adverse events due to rate control. Uh, we published on this a couple of years ago. And the key thing that came up was that physicians are safe using familiar medications. If somebody's already taking metoprolol or atenolol or bisoprolol, most of us will use a beta blocker. Now, if they use calcium channel blockers, and of course they have a heart failure, then, then you probably will use calcium channel blockers as well. But management tends to be pretty individual among physicians and among centers. Some centers will use, Ian Steele showed that, some centers will use mainly calcium channel blockers, irrespective of what the patient comes in with. Some uh, centers will use primarily beta blockers, irrespective of what a patient is already taking. But at our centers, we tend to use what the patient's already on. I think from just the practical point of view that we know they can tolerate this. And again, it's oral versus intravenous. Now, this is always interesting to me how, how you'd use this. And there's no clear guidelines. I can't offer any guidelines on this. A lot of our patients are going to be in the waiting room. Let's be realistic. They may not get monitored beds, even though on your exams, you have to say that they get monitored beds. Um, so oral versus intravenous is interesting. The, uh, you know, banging in five milligrams of metoprolol every five minutes for a monitored patient. I'm not quite sure that needs to get done. I mean, uh, these patients will all be around for investigations for a few hours. There's nothing wrong with giving them 50 orally and see how they do. Uh, sometimes pressures tend to dump. I would be careful using intravenous medications in patients that are elderly and frail or with renal impairment or with end organ damage. Or if I was going to use them, I'd be very judicious. The guidelines say, you know, three times five milligrams of metoprolol or 20 milligrams of diltiazem, but you can always start low and go really slowly. So you don't have to put it in, you know, these studies were, or this evidence was derived in healthy 60 year olds playing hockey you can't use them on 85 year olds from the nursing home with, with, you know, weighing 45 kilograms. I don't think that would be a great idea. So be careful in the intravenous. There's nothing wrong with using oral medications to start with. And often you're in the waiting room. It's not, we give patients beta blockers in the waiting room all the time. If they're in reasonable, as long as they're not in, you know, if they're 150 or so, they should probably try and get a bed, but sometimes there are no beds. If somebody's at 110 or so out in the waiting room, giving a 50 metoprolol while they wait an hour and a half for their bed is probably not a bad strategy from a practical point of view. And again, start low, go slow, especially when frail elderly patients with end organ damage uh, is, is, are, are presenting to you. 
The adverse event rate is approximately 5% and is generally what you'd expect hypotension. These are AV nodal blockers. They will give you hypotension. Generally speaking, these are not serious events. I mean, very few people are going to collapse and die from or arrest from 50 of metoprolol. If you start giving, you know, multiple doses of IV dilpiazem, you know, that might not be the greatest thing in the world. If you start giving, you know, aggressive doses of metoprolol and somebody may have a tiny underlying sepsis that wasn't quite appreciated, you might be causing yourself problems as well. But generally speaking, the adverse event rate tends to be at 5% and the adverse events are transient. Now, everyone's favorite thing, we're going to briefly discuss rhythm control here. Um, for, uh, for flutter, you can only use electrical. It, just does not work with uh, procainamide. Incidentally, it does work with ibutylide, which of course is not available here, but the combination of ibutylide and magnesium, if you're working in Europe ever, uh, tends to work very well. Not licensed in North America though. So fibrillation, you have the option of using electrical or chemical. I think most of us use procainamide. Does anybody use anything else? Perhaps someone who trained outside of British Columbia or Alberta? I've only worked in BC and Alberta, so it's just procainamide. We can't even spell anything else. Propafenone maybe? Nothing? Okay. So, but when we say electrical and chemical cardioversion, one, one thing I, it's right up there with people saying conscious sedation is a pet peeve. It's not conscious sedation, it's general anesthesia, right? I, it's just, it's one of my pet peeves. The same thing is when people say, did you cardiovert him? Well, and they said, yeah, I used procainamide. Well, that's not cardioversion. Well, of course it's cardioversion. If they spontaneously convert, if they use, if you use procainamide or propafenone or electricity, it's, it's cardioversion, right? It's just a matter of which technique gets used first. And when strategies get used, there's electrical, there's people say, oh, did you use electrical cardioversion? I think what most of us really mean to say is it's an electrical first approach. Just like say procainamide for the Ottawa aggressive rule is not chemical cardioversion. It's a chemical first approach. And what that means then, if that doesn't work, then you use the other method. So procainamide, here's the standard dose. It's all your uh, nursing manuals will have this. They'll remember better than you will. The other thing is just propafenone. And patients can, if they're compliant and have done this before, can actually be discharged home in AFib on propafenone if they want to with close follow-up. So if you have somebody who's saying, I feel a bit uncomfortable, I've gone through this before, it's 85, I feel okay, I know there's nothing else going on, I just played hockey and had a few beers last night, I'm a completely reliable patient, can I just take some propafenone and go home? And I'll come back in a few hours if it doesn't get better. That is a very, very reasonable approach for the right patient. If a patient's unreliable or unstable, probably not the greatest idea, but sending, I mean, this is basically your pill in the pocket approach. And if you trust the patient, you have a decent conversation about it. I've discharged patients with 300 of propafenone to convert on their own. I usually phone them back in a couple of hours to see how they're doing. And a good chunk of them will have converted. And that is certainly an option for people to try it. Oh, nice. <laughs> they don't fool around walking and walking and wreck the joint. Uh, the, uh, does, does VGH have that too? Like guys go nuts at triage or do they wait till they, no, I don't know. I don't hang out there often enough. So again, the adverse event rate for procainamide is about uh, 5%, generally transient self-limited hypotension. What to do if uh, people with procainamide get hypotensive? Residents, if a patient gets hypotensive on procainamide, what do you do? Pardon? <laughs> yeah, stop. Yeah, right. stop the procainamide, give them fluids, and then uh, see how they do. That's absolutely it. Reverse the reversibles. Now, uh, so are there any questions with regards to chemical first rhythm control? Notice I didn't say chemical rhythm control, I said chemical first. Ben? Um, I know that it, the literature says that amiodarone is very slow for, for uh, converting patients, but Anecdotally, it seems to be used quite frequently, and like, at least the cardiologists are more comfortable using it because it doesn't have the hypertension associated with okay, they, 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 they certainly are. Where I see amniotic get used a lot is I did a ton of ICU call as a resident. I saw it used in the ICU for patients that they weren't quite sure about. They just started them on an amnio infusion. It's something that I think, um, again, even in the United States, very few emergency physicians are comfortable using it. It is an option. There's no... Um, because of uh, the work Dr. Steele has done and some of the work here, we know that procainamide is safe and widely accepted in North America. The Americans use it as well. Very few emergency departments, even among my American colleagues, will use amiodarone in the emergency department unless it's a cardiologist or an intensivist managing these patients. But it is certainly an option. I think we all know that sedation is pretty safe here. That's a great question, no? I think we all know sedation is pretty safe thanks to the work of Gary and others. Unfortunately, Gary... I don't know if Gary can be here today. He said he'd try and watch from Lionsgate, but he's probably just, you know, 
climbing up the walls there or something, knowing him. Anyway, uh, sedation appears pretty safe. Here's your dose. Just give, you probably give propofol. It's not a painful procedure. You're not unroofing an abscess or setting a fracture. It's, you know, it's uncomfortable a bit, but it's not particularly painful. So this dose of propofol is fine. Uh, use of fentanyl probably is not required. Here's your shock algorithm that, again, most people in Canada will use, although there's certainly no standardized shock, and an anterolateral versus an anterior posture approach for your paddles, honestly. It's a whole bunch of electricity going through you. I don't think it's going to change all that much. Again, the adverse event rate is about 5%, generally related to the sedation. You get some breathing issues and some, this is all from a retrospective point of view. You might get hypotension from the propofol and it's transient. You may get some breathing issues from the sedation as well. Again, discuss the options with the patient. So lots of people have their own thing. Uh, they've been cardioverted, uh, electrically cardioverted 100 times. That's what they want. Or they had a terrible uh, outcome with cardioversion. They want procainamide. They'll know better than you will in a lot of cases, and they'll just tell you what they want. Lastly, disposition. Um, the patient has underlying medically, medical conditions. They should probably be at least consulted. Uh, if the heart rate's 100 beats per minute after management, I know the Canadian guidelines say 110 for some you know, contrary and hipster reason, but it probably 100 is probably appropriate. Uh, and if they're still symptomatic after management, irrespective of their heart rate. If their heart rate's 80 and they still feel like crap, we should probably consult them out. Um, if they're stable, outpatient follow-up is perfectly acceptable range. Generally, cardiology follow-up, although there's excellent family physicians in the community, generally speaking, cardiology follow-up within a couple of weeks is, is, is probably a little bit better on a population basis, even though on an individual basis, like I said, there are outstanding family physicians around. And again, consider the anticoagulation aspect and consider a pill-in-the-pocket approach. I always try and discuss it with people. A lot of people don't want this. A few people do. Our patients read about it. I've had patients, you know, look things up as I'm sedating them and then say, hey, how about this pill in the pocket thing. I think that's a very good idea to discuss with patients, but they also need to follow up for this. If the first time a patient uses a pill in the pocket, they should probably come right to the emergency department for some sort of observation rather than being on their boat after a couple of beers and unmonitored. Take-home points here now. Uh, watch for underlying issues. Cardinal rule number one, this if you're going to have problems, this is where you'll have problems in the eMERGE. Ensure proper anticoagulation. You're not going to have problems in the eMERGE, but three weeks later when they come in hemiplegic, and again, it's rare, that's where you're going to have problems. So those are the two things. Rate versus rhythm control. I think we all know this stuff fairly well. And lastly, we're going to also arrange proper follow-up. I'm going to go into the randomized trial business now, which is all going to be new. Are there any questions? Can I explain anything more lucidly from this last half hour? Dr. Christensen, can you put your thing on, please? Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> make an example of you. <laughs> Thanks, Frank. Um, yeah, very, very nice summary. Um, I, I wonder from what you've looked at or even maybe asking the audience where, <clears throat> what um, level of electricity people generally start at. I know the guidelines say what you put up, 100, 150, 200. <clears throat> I've never really understand, understood why that makes any sense because if there's a significant number of patients that don't convert with 100 and require more, why don't we just start with more? So I've been using just 200 right off the bat for a long time, knowing there's no cardiac damage to that, and it potentially is one or two less attempts at cardioversion. So what are, what are people actually doing? Are you complying with that or not? From a patient-centered point of view, would you want 100 or 200? I want 200. You want 200? Yep. So we'll, 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 we'll get to that afterwards because one of the things we actually checked was patient's pain level after getting getting converted, which is one of the things we did, we did check out. Um, I think I'd want to be cardioverted with... 0.1 of a joule more than I needed is my answer, and I'd want it done as quickly as possible. If I could be, car the old literature will tell you that, you know, 20 or 50 is good enough for atrial flutter. It's not. It just doesn't work. Uh, you might get lucky and it works, but th those are studies on, you know, single patient end of one studies done in the 19, 1960s in the Kennedy administration on army volunteers, which said, you know, that this worked. You know, anything, you treat it the same way. This this thing of a lower threshold is probably, is, is, is not true. Um, I think 200 is perfectly acceptable. I think for Dr. Steele's trial that he's doing right now, he's just going straight with 200. And I think the uh, the, the starting level of the patient people are using has gone up in the past 10 years since I've been here, right? Um, ultimately, I think the vast majority of these patients are going to convert. Uh, if you sort of waste a shock at 100, I don't think it's much of a difference because eventually you will escalate. Um, Again, I can't provide any strong guidance with respect to this. I think starting at 100 is fine. I think starting at 200 is fine. Um, very political answer. Thank you. Um, <laughs> what did, from your looking at? Are most people starting with 100 or most here? So um, I haven't looked at any prospective data 
uh, in the last few years. Most of our, uh, the patients, papers that we published are from 2007 to 2011, and people were largely using 100, 150, 200. When I worked at, uh, in Foothills a couple of years ago, where they're incredibly aggressive about this stuff, uh, generally speaking, they start off at 100 as well. Again, there doesn't appear to be much evidence. I haven't surveyed the group recently to find out what's going on. Uh, maybe the residents can uh, help out a bit, especially the ones that work at other sites. We have that in our, we have that, oh, sorry. Uh, we have the that data in our data set for the anticoagulation issue, so we should be able to pull it up fairly quickly. Okay. Is there, is there any evidence that a single shock of 200 joules versus 100 joules is going to cause any clinically significant difference in myocardial stunning and increased hypertension or anything like that? No. <laughs> No, there isn't. Um, what, what, what's the what's suspected? And this is something we checked out actually during our uh, during our uh, during this. So I'm going to talk about this now. Was actually patient centered outcomes um, for uh, for electrical first versus chemical first conversion, and I'll I'll get into that in a little bit. So uh, we're going to conclude this portion here. And now we got 24 minutes. Yes. So when we see the stable AFib that we anticoagulant and we refer to um, refer to atrial fib. Do they get seen in a timely manner? And what do you know what happens to them? I mean, we don't see them again. Um, that's, a, that's a great question because off time, though, the loop isn't closed. And often the AFib clinic patient who's seen a private clinic that doesn't show up on our Sunrise Clinical Manager. Uh, maybe if you check those accelerators envelopes in your, in your lockers, which most of us just used to you know, start bonfires uh, or line the birdcage, uh, sometimes you will actually see referred to the AFib clinic. I think most patients, I think the waiting time is about two to three weeks, which is probably appropriate. And often it's just a discussion. The anticoagulation will usually be continued. Usually emergency physicians in the last little while have been quite good about this kind of stuff. And uh, often, uh, especially some of our younger patients, the first thing they want to know about is ablation. A lot of the time, uh, that's not something we have any control over. A lot of the time, the AFib clinic has to talk patients down because patients have been reading for weeks and weeks and they think this is going to save their lives. A large part of the AFib clinic is to risk stratify into who would benefit from ablation versus who would benefit from medical management versus watchful waiting. Uh, but patients generally at our site in Mount St. Joseph's get seen within about two to three weeks. And Mount St. Joseph's is actually quicker because they just go to the general cardiology clinic often and Dr. Tang who runs that is, is remarkably good at this and his, uh, his summaries are remarkably lucid. Hey, Frank, I was just wondering if you looked at, and maybe you already reported on it and I missed it, but uh, adverse effects with propafenone. I, I, there's nothing to report, unfortunately. Uh, there's a, an Italian study in the New England Journal from 2004, which I sort of remember reviewing in the journal club when I was a little resident. And uh, that was the first pill in the pocket approach. Patients generally tend to do pretty well. It's more of a slow acting medication. So hypotension is, is, um, uh, is certainly less of a concern than with procainamide. Um, I don't have enough experience with it personally. I use it maybe twice a year, if that. And patients will, the patients, at least I use it on, I've got like, you know, the, the, the mark of non-conversion, they don't even convert with me on that. So I usually have to end up, uh, you know, giving them a bit of electricity anyway. So I unfortunately don't have the personal experience and there's no emergent literature on this either. The strategy of say sending a patient home to have them come back in six to 12 hours if they haven't converted is used anecdotally and it's used on an ad hoc unstructured basis, but there's no systematic, uh, um, uh, that no one's ever systematically described this, but that's a really good question. Yeah, because we just anecdotally, we had somebody the other day who was told to take their propafenone in the emergency department, as you mentioned, for their first dose, mm -hmm. which was a good idea. She was a healthy 55-year-old, perfect candidate, yeah. and she just plummeted. She was on three pressers in about an hour. It's funny how a drug company trial didn't never report of that. I can't quite put that together. So, But cautionary tale, Dr. Kasson. Um. Yeah, Frank, could you just comment on your choice of medications? If you're trying to rate control to somebody and your first choice doesn't work, and there's always a concern about giving calcium channel blockers and, and beta blockers together. So if you give metoprolol orally, are you safer giving a calcium channel blocker afterwards, um, considering that you take care of any sort of congestive heart failure or whatever else is driving the, 
the rate at the same I, time? I think that's an absolutely great question. Uh, one of my most serious adverse events uh, happened when I gave somebody 2.5 of Latizum IV after 15 of Metoprolol didn't work. I gave it slowly and the patient still rested. We brought him back. We did fine. But uh, we ended up doing about 30 seconds of CPR and I'm inserting dopamine. Um, that experience, you know, was a little bit, you know, unpleasant. And uh, I don't usually mix a class of medications. If I've gone as far as I can with the metoprolol, A, I start looking a bit deeper as it is something else going on here. Why is this guy not responding? Is there no called sepsis? Is there a PE? Am I being stupid? You know, do I need to call for help? That's usually a signal already that something's a bit off with this patient. I think one of the things we learn as emergency physicians is to, uh, is pattern recognition. Like, uh, you know, I'm I don't know as much as I did when I was a resident, but I, I can recognize patterns better because I have a bit of experience now. And uh, I, I realize that the majority of patients I give some metoprolol to, their heart rate should slow a little bit. And uh, when it doesn't, then I start wondering if I'm actually missing something. And then I'll probably do a full workup on the patient and give them a bit of fluids more than I would normally see how they do. And if something else is going on, I'll treat that. And if there's not, I might actually call a, uh, I might actually call for help in the situation. And this, this applies even more if you're working in a rural or underserviced area, that it's not a bad idea to, uh, you know, when, when something isn't working like it should, and this applies to all of emergency medicine, medicine in general, rather than proceeding on what you've been doing or trying to do something you haven't tried before, don't be afraid to call for help. I mean, the cardiologist might say, well, you're kind of stupid or boy, you're a, even for a duty doctor, you're not very smart, but uh, okay, maybe I'll come down and help you out. I think it's a very, very realistic thing to call because the chances are pretty good that in fact you are missing something and something occult is going on that our tests or your tests just are not picking up. I think it's almost a signal to start digging deeper rather than keeping on the track that you're going. And that's actually a great question, which speaks also to our thinking process. It's also a great bias and question for the residents that, you know, once you're in sort of a track, it's very difficult to uncouple yourself from that and try and switch thought trains. But I think uh, this is a great example of that. All righty. Hopefully, we uh, can cover this reasonably quickly here. I'd uh, booked about, uh, and uh, I'd booked a bit more time for this. The following people have been instrumental in, uh, from a, from a, from an educational, from a research, from a logistics point of view, and also from a more, uh, an emotional support point of view. Running a randomized trial across multiple centers is not an easy thing to do. It doesn't get very done very often, especially not in Western Canada. Doing this uh, took a lot out of me. I had to take a bunch of time off last year because of it. Uh, the following people are appreciated uh, more than they know. Thank you. So when we talk about electrical versus chemical, what we really mean is electrical first versus chemical first. So the, again, the Ottawa aggressive rule is a chemical first, then electrical strategy. What we tend to use, what we tend to use in Alberta, generally speaking, I think most of us will tend to use electricity first. If that doesn't work, though, you're not just going to call cardiology. You're going to start procainamide. So we know both methods are safe. We know both methods of a 95% success rate. We know almost all the patients will get discharged. There's been one prior study on this, and it's from Italy. It's published a couple of years ago. And that study was plagued by, you know, you know 30% non-follow-up. Uh, patients did not get the uh, other method if they failed. So if you failed one, you were sent home in AFib. Right? You did not get the other method. Every patient had a, an emergency department-based echocardiogram, which you don't have access to. And uh, so the study was done a little bit differently than what we would choose to do. So we picked six emergency departments in Western Canada. This, uh, again, is, is not that easy to do. You have to actually incur for a non-funded study, especially. You can't just show up with a, you know, a large blank check and say, I'd like to be part of the study. People tend not to like that very much. So I had to go around to a number of sites across British Columbia and Alberta and try and interest them in this unfunded study, which is not the easiest thing to do. Uh, and I got a lot of non-subtle turndowns here, uh, to say the least, right? So uh, the emergency departments were Lionsgate Hospital, Mount St. Joseph, Sturgeon in uh, St. Albert, Alberta, South Health Campus in South Calgary, and then um, University of Alberta Hospital in Edmonton and uh, St. Paul. So we uh, con enrolled consecutive eligible patients. Here's the eligibility criteria. This is basically patients we would use rhythm control in, right? Age 18 to 75, above age 75, there's a chance of, you know, they can't describe the illness very well. The AFib has to be less than 48 hours or appropriately anticoagulated, and there could be no acute underlying issues. Some of the uh, referrals I got were interesting. One patient had um, thyroid cancer, 
uh, unappreciated by the emergency physician, a couple of separate patients, a couple of post-op valves, uh, you know, were referred and I'm like, yeah, it's probably not quite appropriate if they have a fever after getting their TAVI and they're 86 years old, you know, thank you for referring them. But, but, you know, it becomes very difficult to coax physicians to calling, right? We didn't have research assistance floating around 24 hours here. It would be nice to, but at Lionsgate in here, we don't. So our physicians were nice enough to actually pick up the phone and call me like at two in the morning, at three in the afternoon, you know, or call a research assistant. So physicians did a lot, and they did the pre-enrolling. And I wish more staff emergency physicians were here because you did a great job, like to say the least, both Lionsgate, St. Paul's, and Mount St. Joe's. Like people called me, people called other research assistants, uh, people discussed cases with me, and some of them were like, well, the guy's in flutter. Is he part of your study? No, but thank you so much for calling. There were small prizes installed here. Uh, there, every month we talked about this at rounds. I think it will work remarkably well. A bit different in Alberta where they have like 20 or 30 research assistants hovering around for all of Brian Rose studies and they were able to jump in. But I think overall, considering the support we had, I think things went very well. And that's a testament again to our group of emergency physicians who did a great job. So this is just standard, uh, you know, talk about randomized trials, concealed allocation. There was online block randomization. It was done through... <laughs> It was done through uh, REDCap, which is from the University of Nashville. All the data entry was online, and the data collection was web-based, login, password protected, pretty much state-of-the-art. Even a couple of years ago, you'd be using sealed envelopes in the bottom of a desk drawer, which would have gotten lost. Everything's done online now. Thanks to Brian Rohr for setting that up. So electrical first strategy versus chemical first. If the first method worked, great, you're home. Second method, uh, first method didn't work, you got the second method. So did any emergency physician, except Jim Christensen and who else I've told directly, know what the primary outcome was? So the primary outcome, man, we carefully kept this because it had to be, this is one where you, everyone said, oh, it's the efficiency and conversion rate. Mm, sort of, but not quite. So the primary outcome is the emergency department length of stay. Alrighty. And uh, the reason I couldn't say that to anybody is because that might affect how you uh, how you treat things. You might say, well, you know, I really want this method to be better because it's not a blinded study, right? I mean, the patient's not blinded, the emergency physician's not blinded, whoever's recording the data's not blinded. So we couldn't just say, well, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, it's this or that to drive the study one way or the other. So it was always a fun, this is the first time I've told anybody, except for, for Jim and Brian Rowe. Um, uh, and Gary, but we couldn't tell anybody this, otherwise it does affect your management, right? So the clinicians were unaware, a really key point of the study. Uh, we said it was the efficiency of the study. And one of the things we also said, if you ask me, well, I've started on a procainamide, how long do I wait? A standard question and a question that's never, ever been answered. Nobody knows. So there's a standard response and it's derived from some of our other studies where I said 50% of patients will convert in one hour. Sorry, of the patients that will convert, 50% will convert in one hour, 90% will convert in two hours, and that's all the information you're getting. So people could make their own decisions on that. And what drives things then is, you know, not just the one hour, two hour, three hours, but how close is it to the end of my shift? Is the rest of the department falling apart? Did a big stabbing desk show up? Did uh, the cardiologist yell at me? Did, uh, you know, did the, 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 the CNL say something nasty to me? Am I in the waiting room? Uh, am I going to hand over some patients to have two interns working with me? So all these things make a difference in the real emergency department, and that's what drives length of stay is all this other stuff. So the other things we looked at were length of stay, conversion rates, pre-specified adverse events. Uh, patients were also contacted at 3 and 30 days for revisits, strokes, deaths, uh, visits to family physicians, as well as what's called patient-related uh, outcome measurements. And that's something that's actually quite important. About five years ago or 10 years ago, we would have said quality of life. But now it's called sort of a more patient-centered thing where it's not a physician that reports on, on, on perceived outcomes, but a, a patient actually reports on how they feel. There's no separate score for AFib. But we used, uh, we, we, we used uh, a part of the SF8 score, which was the best we could do with the data at the time. In the last two, three years since we designed the study, because we designed it in 2011, 2012, new literature has come out here. But this was state-of-the-art at the time. Sample size is, uh, ended up being, uh, sorry, this should say uh, 43 patients per group. Uh, we used a student as predicted students t-test and man whitney test to assess for uh, to assess for uh, comparison between groups uh, p-value of 0 0.05 was taken as significant that's pretty standard so before i talk about results what is it like to actually run one of these things well you don't sleep much i work a lot of overnights and often i get a call at 6 a.m after i had been home for half an hour and was falling asleep i have to drive back and get turned down generally speaking our um, 
our girl physicians, female physicians, were much better at at getting patients enrolled than our male physicians. Often I'd come in, and uh, the person who really stands out here is uh, Kelly Ogilvy and Ann Watt. Uh, when I walked in there, that patient was signed, sealed, and delivered. Right? They had everything prepped beautifully. Uh, the patients knew exactly what was going on. All the questions have been answered. ECAT, you were pretty good too, uh, to say the least. Uh, some physicians, they'd say, yeah, I've got the patient all done up. They know all about the study. I'd walk into the room, and they'd be like, what are you talking about, man? So, uh, you know, and of course, then the chance of a turndown was a lot higher. I, I think of uh, female physicians in our group, even though they're probably a, cover about a third of the shifts, is that about right? Probably in, got more than half the patients enrolled, which I don't know why that happened, but they were, and it was almost, it, when, when, uh, when a male physician called me in, yeah, I'd usually get accepted. But with, when a female physician called me in, I almost always got accepted. And I actually asked how much time got spent talking about the study. And for some of the guys, it was about 30 seconds. And for some of the, like, I mean, Dr. Ogilvy is very thorough and she'd take 10 or 15 minutes to discuss the study with the patients. And uh, ever, too bad she can't be here, but I <laughs> had to throw in a few bottles of wine for that one. That was a remarkably well done. But it does, these studies don't happen by themselves and it does take that level of cooperation to do that. I think my favorite one was, uh, I was about three months into the study and uh, I needed to go for a ride. So I don't know who, uh, who rides Seymour. All right, there's a trail called Ned. It was just like pouring rain at the bottom of Seymour. It was snowing by top of Ned's, which is pretty much the only thing you can safely do in March without killing yourself. Anyway, I just dropped in and I got a call from, um, from Lionsgate. So I'm like, well, I should probably ignore this, but I'm like, ah. So I hike back up and ride all the way down the road, clean up, and I'm covered in mud. And about an hour later, I'm at Lionsgate and I parked illegally, of course, with predictable results. And anyway, I'm in the room and you, can, you walk into the room and you're like, you already kind of know you got an uphill battle. And I explained, the physician actually done a really nice job explaining it. And uh, I walked in and uh, they're like, well, that sounds really interesting, but our, our son's an anesthesia resident in Winnipeg. We'll call him. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh, so for 45 minutes, and he comes in from West Vancouver and uh, he's like, listens for a while. And then he pulls him aside and says, what are you doing? You're an idiot. You know, you are at least an R2 in anesthesia. And I'm like, you're going to give her a stroke. She's had this for months. And I'm like, well, what she's had for months is intermittently, but this episode is clearly started a couple hours ago. So, you know, I think it's pretty safe. Anyway, he's like, well, why don't we call my cardiologist brother who's in Nashville? And I'm sure he's a, you know, I looked him up. He's board eligible, if you know what that means. Anyway, he works at a private hospital there. And of course, he put him on speakerphone and he just basically calls me up. You know, I'm a stroker out. I'm an idiot. You see a cardiologist, an electrophysiologist immediately. How could it be so heartless? Anyway, because of the study, first of all, I trashed my ride, which is bloody annoying. Then I go in there. I made things way worse. I spent five hours there overall. You know, that got turned down. I mean, and the patient had to be admitted for two days. And I had to write, basically write John Weisler a letter of apology for had this completely unnecessary admission now. So, you know, and it, but again, nothing bad happened. It's It's... Kicking the nuts, kind of, but I mean, those pardon me, but that kind of stuff does happen. But but that's kind of what it's like. And then some other patients, you'd be, you know, especially at Lionsgate, I get called at like seven in the morning. I had the patient be signed, sealed, and delivered, uh, and I'd be back home by seven forty-five. Like some days, it went that smoothly. Consented, and, I, and nice patients too. Like I actually ended up electrocuting all my parents' friends, <laughs> like because they're playing tennis or whatever, and they're like, "Oh, you're Frank and Karen." So, oh, how nice to meet you. And that's after I electrocuted them, of course. But it was a little, <laughs> it was a little bit embarrassing, right? Anyway, uh, no too many adverse events. The most spectacular was probably Dr. Eberts when uh, this <coughs> large male who probably uh, underestimated his own cocaine use. Uh, I know we only have a few minutes here. <laughs> Ended up basically flipping himself out of bed and landing right on his face. I've never seen a reaction like that before. I think I talked to Gary and said, yeah, that's a paradoxical reaction. But it was a little embarrassing. He seemed pretty nonplussed about the whole thing. I so fell on my face. Worse has happened. Anyway, that's what it's like to run a randomized trial. There's a lot of sleepless nights. I ended up taking a bunch of time off last year because of this. Uh, I was funded by Calgary. I got great support from Edmonton. I got great support from you guys. Thank you. Here's the results. So a lot of patients were screened, right? But that's every eighth year patient gets screened. If you're 88 years old or have had it for a month, if you've got gout and AFib, you were screened. 135 patients were eligible, 49 declined, which is what we expected. And the patients that declined basically had been zapped 300 times before, or they'd been a, or, or, or their grandma had died under anesthesia and they wanted procainamide. So basically, people had the, the main reason for not being in the study was I've had it 50 times before, you're an idiot, just do what my cardiologist always does. So we got 86 patients. So the important thing is, the group of 
non-enrolled patients and the group of enrolled patients exactly the same, except the group of non-enrolled patients have more AFib experiences previously and more conversions, which is exactly what we expected. Here's the ages of chemical versus electrical first groups. So chemical means chemical first, electrical means electrical first. Median age, residents, does that look similar? Percent male or female, does that look similar? Percent CHAD zero. So obviously there's about 40 baseline variables, but would you say these groups are well balanced? There's your table one. Good. Let's talk about the conversion rates. So from electrical first and a chemical first point of view, the only patient that didn't convert was somebody who was treated electrically, but after they failed to convert electrically, nobody started procainamide. Somebody called the cardiologist instead, and the cardiologist said, you didn't convert electrically, you're hopeless, Here's metoprolol C in the office. That's it. <laughs> Send them home in AFib, which is something I think most emergency physicians wouldn't do. It's a protocol violation, but it's, it has to be included. Your conference is scheduled to end in two minutes. Oh, come on. Length of stay. Okay, here, here's the money shot, okay? Now, is that significant? Right? That's a huge difference. That's what the study's about. Now, the time from triage to randomization is the same. The time from conversion to discharge is the same. So where's the difference? That's your conversion time, randomization of conversion. So that equals the time from the, when you make the decision to when the patient resumes normal sinus, that's a fourfold difference. Would you say there's a difference? So for a randomized trial, even if it's a modest one, this is a very strong treatment effect. A couple more things, adverse event rates, 22 to 24%. We used really subtle ones, thanks to Gary. Every time you have to like, you know, tilt somebody's jaw by a millimeter, that's an adverse event. That's similar. Stroke percentage is zero. Patient reported outcomes. I'm going to use on a five-point Likert scale. We use these things. Again, remarkably similar. So you're seeing a great deal of similarity in baseline variables and outcomes, except for one thing, right? Limitations of the study. Yeah, it's in a Canadian emerge. It's just a bunch of duty doctors. Length of stay isn't a traditional outcome, but it's becoming more common. And 35% of patients declined. Discussion. Part one. Part two. These groups are the same. The second randomized trial to do it's the first with this sort of parallel group approach. It's the first with 100% follow-up, which we also got. We were very lucky to get that. And it's the first with any kind of quality of life or, or patient reported scores. So it represents a substantial advancement on what's been done before. Randomized trials aren't that common. 30-day outcomes aren't that common. We phone patients for AFib stuff. I wish I'd published this already, but it's taken some time, but it's going to get submitted. Your conference is now over. Goodbye. And I've timed that very well. Thank you.